in 1962 almost 9 years after the model was published and uh, fiber diffraction images were published uh, crick watson and uh, morris wilkins got a nobel prize for physiology and medicine in 1962 now let's just hear watson he is fairly senior at the point this uh, this particular interview was taken let's just let's just hear his voice because he is one of the very very major figures of biology in in the last century i i guess my chief advantage came from uh, my you know coming from the field of genetics where the big question is what is the gene and uh, i sort of box myself in and that was the only problem we're solving uh Whereas Rothlin was trained as a physical chemist, Morris as a as a physicist, uh, they didn't see themselves, you know, as having only one objective. Uh, so my advantage, one was, it was the only thing I wanted to do, and uh, second, the other advantage was I had a collaborator who was Francis. so uh, one can't underestimate the importance if i come to cambridge and francis wasn't there uh i wouldn't have found the structure of dna uh you know i wouldn't have you know had someone to talk about the meaning of the x-ray diffraction and uh, prus and kenru were interested in proteins so uh, francis saw dna as uh, tremendously uh, You know, oh, I should say, Francis Sautier is potentially, you know, the most exciting molecule around. All right. So that was uh, James Watson uh, sitting here in Cold Spring, La Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, he joined Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and was its director for a very long time, and he settled over there. Uh, major role in setting up uh, leadership in in that in in that particular institute. Francis Crick uh, went to uh, Salk Institute in San Diego, and uh, there he set up uh, uh, again a very very nice set of units. The actual structure of DNA came fairly late. There's a paper in 1979 about the Z form of DNA, which I'll talk about, and uh, another uh, uh, paper in 1980 from Dickerson's lab, where the first turn of B DNA was was solved. Now. these structures came almost 20 years after protein structures came and part of the reason was that dna is a very flexible and a very floppy molecule and it's this floppiness of dna which makes it extremely difficult to crystallize uh, which is why fiber diffraction was the means to get gather data data on dna in the earth. so let's now go into the chemical structure of dna here is the dna double helix in front of you and uh, in blue orange green and uh, red are the bases which are uh, inside the double helix with the phosphate backbone outside the double helix uh, this is the way the backbone look, looks phosphate sugar uh, phosphate sugar phosphate sugar with the bases sticking out and these bases sticking out form hydrogen bonds with an opposite base to make the dna double helix and uh, effectively what is holding these two strands together are hydrogen bonds you can see these hydrogen bonds as dotted lines between uh, adenine and thymine which is a double bond and between uh, guanine and cytosine which is pretty much a triple bond so the double helical structure of dna consists of two anti parallel sheets and these two anti parallel sheets are anti parallel because one is running to a 5 prime uh, to a 3 prime orientation and the other is running in completely the opposite orientation right because some of you asked uh, here is a little bit more detail uh, these are the four different nucleotides with the base the sugar and the phosphate uh, basically uh, circled over here this is uh, deoxy adeno adenosine triphosphate which is used to which is polymerized along with the other uh, uh, nucleotides to make up dna this is uh, dgtp i am using the small form dctp and dttp okay this is the sugar itself uh, and so one of you asked me a question about labeling uh, 
So this is the labeling of the carbon atoms in the sugar: carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five. And the polymerization of the nucleotides is happening from five prime to three prime direction, which is basically uh, this direction, which is why we say five prime to three prime. And deoxyribose ribose is the sugar used for DNA, but for RNA, the sugar which is used by the molecule is different. It is basically ribose, and you can see that the difference primarily is. at this point where uh, the oxygen group is missing in in the case of the sugar in dna but not the sugar in uh, in rna here is how the nucleotides are coming together and uh, this is done by uh, basically by dna polymerase it is taking a nucleotide at a time and putting them in a very specific sequence one after the other and this is usually done when it's copying of the other strand something i'll i'll show you and you can see the release of a proton and the release of a uh, of a diphosphate group each time this is happening i'll uh, uh, strongly urge all of you to do this homework i would ask you to draw all four nucleotides uh, draw a tumor that is put two nucleotides together and see how uh, you you lose uh, two uh, two phosphates and a proton and also draw a schematic of a anti parallel uh, double helix here is a here is again a picture showing you the phosphate sugar phosphate sugar phosphate sugar phosphate sugar backbone and the nucleotides in this case adenine sticking out from the sugars uh, which makes up one strand of the dna double helix uh this is something you can practice it's useful for you to do so So here I'm going to demonstrate drawing the simple structure of DNA and now you don't need to be an artist to do this so what the IB cares about is that you get the relative positions of the phosphate group the deoxyribose sugar both of those known as the sugar phosphate backbone and the nitrogenous bases relatively they need to be in the correct positions Now as I draw the second strand here please note that it is anti parallel um my deoxyribose pentose sugar is effectively like pointing down this is somewhat difficult to draw on a computer screen for you what you might want to do is actually turn the page upside down so you're drawing the same shape is just in the opposite direction Now once you have drawn it you want to make sure that you label everything so that's the hydrogen bonds the covalent bonds the nitrogenous bases deoxyribose the phosphate group and go ahead and draw a line around a nucleotide as well So this gives you an idea of uh, the biochemistry as well as the structure of of DNA and uh, uh, this is something you should you should sit down and draw so let me move on now in the last 5 minutes to the last topic which is basically the variety of dna forms now so rosalind franklin could uh, move between these two forms which gave different patterns on fiber diffraction images by just changing the humidity of the chamber in which the the dna was there so so in in other ways in so to emphasize if this particular strand of dna which you are seeing over here this b form of dna had a sequence and i'm just going to write, write down a random sequence this doesn't have any meaning a t g c c c c a a a if this was the sequence the same sequence could make b form of dna or a form of dna depending on the humidity of the chamber and the salt concentration which was there uh, in uh, in the solution in which the fiber was sitting now the three major forms of dna there are many many forms of dna which have been discovered over the years but the classical forms are b form dna a form dna and z form dna b and a form basically are right handed whereas the z form is kind of left handed and the handedness can be seen if you look down the axis and follow 5 prime to 3 prime whether it is turning it's a right handed it's going in a clockwise fashion or in a anti clockwise fashion there is something called as a major groove and this is an architectural feature which is over here and there is something called as a minor groove which is uh, basically somewhere over here okay the base pairs per helical turn so this is a helical turn are slightly different as you can see the a form of dna is basically a little bit more compact so this is one turn and uh, again this is one turn so you can see that the base pairs per turn seem to change okay and there are other small differences which finally lead to a, a kind of 
different, let's use the term conformations of DNA, which you see. And there are biological implications of these different forms of DNA, which I will really not be talking about at, at this point. Sir, please re-explain the group part. What is exactly the group? The group is that uh, it is basically a, a large, let's call this a hole over here, uh, or it is a sort of a docking site. So this would be the major group of, of DNA, this one, architecturally, okay? And in fact, if you see over here, we know that there is a triple helical form of DNA which also exists. And if you look carefully at the triple, triple helical form, specifically if you look at the way the yellow is, the yellow, uh, uh, the third helix is coming, you will realize that it actually sits in this major group like this, okay? So the major group is an architectural feature and it is actually used by proteins which are docking to, to, the, to, to, to DNA. The B form of DNA has a very large uh, major group. Okay, so over here, this is the major group and this is the minor group. And so, sir, and what is exactly meant by anti and syn glycosyl bond conformation? Okay, so this is basically uh, basic chemistry. Can you just do a search, a Google search as to what anti and syn means? It's no, no, I, sir, I understand the meaning, but here, what is, uh, what does it mean? Exactly? There is no difference in the meaning. Remember, DNA is nothing but a chemical entity. So the okay, same, okay. Uh, same definition for anti and syn, which is there in chemistry is the definition over here. Okay, okay, sir. okay. So there are 10 base pairs per helical turn in B form, right? Yes. There are written 10.5. Okay, so I have got this from a textbook. And uh, I guess there are small variations between textbooks. Remember, DNA is a floppy, flexible entity, uh, which is a dynamic entity. It is constantly jumping around. Okay. Uh, so okay, measurements of different people may change slightly. Okay. Let me end by talking about size scales. I just want you to appreciate the volumes of these molecular entities. On the right-hand side, I have explained very basic things, which you already know that a nanometer is 10 raised to nine meter and a micrometer is basically 10 raised to three nanometers. The term, the unit angstrom is used in crystallography quite a lot. 10 angstrom is basically one nanometer, all right? Now, this is the B form of DNA, 60 base pairs. You know what a base pair is now. And it will basically be about uh, 204 angstroms in length. These are three proteins, a small protein lysozyme, a middling protein DNA gyrase, uh, you can see all these holes in DNA gyrus where uh, DNA will actually slide through these holes. And there is a large protein over here, which is one of the largest known in the cell, which is the ribosome. So you can appreciate volume scales and size scales by looking at uh, DNA with respect to gyrase, lysozyme and ribosome. Now, uh, DNA is not naked in the cell, especially in the eukaryotic cell. It is wound around a set of proteins called nucleosomes. And on the left-hand side, you see a picture of these nucleosomes and two and a half turns, which is what uh, DNA wraps around uh, octamer of, uh, of, uh, of the nucleosomes. These octamers can slide along the DNA, which is also a very interesting feature of DNA. And at the bottom is a more realistic representation rather than just a ball and stick representation of the histone octamer and the linker DNA between them. The histone H1 acts as a sort of a clip, clip making sure that uh, the octamer does not fall apart. And this naked DNA is then folded it around the nucleosome. Nucleosomes themselves fold into higher, higher order chromatin structures. And these chromatin fibers keep on folding into higher and higher order structures, finally making up a chromosome. So I'll stop over here.